Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily, I'm Aaron Porras. And coming up in today's newscast, coronavirus cases seem to be slowing, but that hasn't quelled fears around a second wave. A couple of settlements in Judea and Samaria are left out of plans for annexation, and a number of Israelis have taken the web by storm in the midst of their COVID-caused hardships. Stay tuned to see who they are. tonight with tragic news on the coronavirus front. The latest death resulting from COVID-19 complications in Israel, and this as Tel Aviv closes in fast on Jerusalem as the epicenter for the virus's spread. A shock to the system. The passing of 26-year-old Kfar Saba man Oshri Asulin, leaving the coronavirus death toll in question. Israel's health ministry is saying that Asulin succumbed to complications related to the virus overnight after being sedated and in intensive care for over a month. But the health ministry is yet to confirm him as an official COVID-19 victim, as he tested negative for the virus at the time of his passing. The cause of death is being classified as inflammation of the heart muscles developed in the wake of his coronavirus infection. It's the same heart condition developed by a number of children who contracted the virus. But his mother is now lashing out saying her son passed away due to negligence. וקררתי לרופאים וצעקתי להם, בואו, בואו תראו איך מעבירים את הילד. כל, ה- כל המדדים ירדו וכל ה- החשמל לא עובד. This is the account of a distraught mother, with Oshri's family saying that he tested negative for the virus, even at the time of his passing, adding to the family's pushback. בשביעי לשישי אושרי התאספז בבית חולים שיבא בתל השומר. הוא היה במיון קורונה, הוא עשה בדיקת קורונה, שלוש פעמים יצא לו שלילים. If COVID-19 is related, though, Oshri would be Israel's youngest coronavirus victim. The latest infection numbers finally slowing, the health ministry recording its lowest rate in over a week on Sunday, at some 83 new cases in the past 24 hours. The figures mark the first time since June 6th that the number of daily cases has dropped below 100. The death toll sits at 302, one of the two latest fatalities appears to be Oshri. Still, a top Israeli health official is warning that Israel is already experiencing a second wave of the virus. With 1.5% of virus tests coming back positive overnight, when only 0.5% of daily tests were positive at the start of lockdown rollbacks. I want to say that what we have seen in the experience that we have seen now is that in all countries, we don't really know how to do this from the risk of risk. We see this here and there 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 and there. While the education system has been the center of the latest outbreak, the health ministry has stood firm on a full reopening, allowing parents to go back to work. Sadetsky, now reflecting on the decision that has seen some 200 schools with virus cases, sending tens of thousands of students and faculty back into quarantine. Meantime, Israel is reportedly deporting the son of American media magnate Shari Redstone for violating the country's quarantine rules. Brandon Korf had been granted an exceptional permit by Israel's Population and Immigration Authority to visit his brother, who is serving in the Israeli military. But Korf secretly visited his model girlfriend, Yael Shelbia, who is also doing her compulsory military service. While the statement didn't mention 18-year-old Shelbia by name, it says that Korf, who is in his mid-30s, violated the isolation orders from the moment he entered the country, visiting his Israeli partner and staying with her in the same apartment. He was ordered to leave the country immediately. Briefly, Israel is reportedly in advanced talks with Moderna to buy its coronavirus vaccine. That's entering its final stage of testing. 
Israel Daily Ynet quoting unnamed officials at Israel's health ministry. Moderna confirming it planned to start a trial of some 30,000 volunteers in July. Moving away from coronavirus now, a terrible and violent incident still playing out in the arrest of several suspects connected to the attack on a Palestinian man in Hebron. Tracy Alexander reports. This is the Israeli soldier being praised by the IDF chief of staff today after the Golani Brigade member rushed in to break up this violent scene in the city of Hebron in Judea and Samaria. Two more Israelis have been arrested early this morning on suspicion of attacking this Palestinian man and the soldier identified as Effie who came to the victim's aid. The latest suspects, a man and a minor, will be questioned by police after the arrest on Sunday of two Israeli teenagers. The investigation will look into why this group of settler youths were found assaulting a Palestinian man Friday night and why they also launched at the soldier who moved in to break up the brawl. Police say six others, three men, and three minors have also been apprehended for allegedly throwing rocks and damaging Palestinian vehicles. All suspects are set to appear for a remand hearing at the Jerusalem's Magistrate Court today. Meanwhile, just two weeks left before Israel plans to extend sovereignty to parts of the West Bank or Judea and Samaria. The IDF is girding for an expected violent fallout. Specifically, widespread protests, stabbings and suicide bombings not seen since the days of the Second Intifada in the early 2000s. But the scale of the annexations and the likely Palestinian response is still unknown, leaving top army officials, quote, working in a fog. Foreign Minister Gabi Ashkenazi is still working with the United States to put together a working map. Then adding to the fog, Jordanian King Abdullah II is blocking calls by Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu while also refusing to solidify a date to meet with Defense Minister Gantz for talks on annexations. So between the attacks on Hebron and the preparations on the border, what can we expect from the seemingly building powder keg? Joining us to answer is founder and president of the Jerusalem Washington Center, Gideon Israel. Gideon, thank you so much for joining us now. Reportedly, the IDF is also making alternate plans uh, just in case there aren't actually any riots. Do you think that there's a chance of that, that, that uh, you know, the response is blowing blowing up in our head more than it is in reality well well the palestinian authority and it's and the media that it runs always keeps um keeps the uh um always is, is trying to uh be mesit against uh against israel to incite against israel and therefore it's always on a low flame and when when the palestinian authority wants there to be riots then it just ri it rises the the the, fl the flames of incitement and incites more against israel so we can, get an, um, we can get an indication of how things will be if we look at what's going on in their media. I see. And so now l let's move a little bit to the Yesha Council head now, uh, the heads of the Yesha Council in the settlements now. They're still fighting against the annexation plans. They're saying that, uh, first of all, that there are a number of issues that they feel are not being addressed appropriately, and also that they don't understand why the plans are being rushed within about a month's time, uh, where this is arguably one of the most important decisions that Israel has made in decades. Do you, why do you think Israel is pushing you know, this schedule? Well, there are, three, there are three points of disagreement, first of all. The first point is that, um, that, in, that, that according to the maps, even though we haven't seen them yet, um, there are a certain amount of uh, settlements which are which will be under Palestinian control, and therefore um, I Israel won't be able to expand those settlements. They'll only be able to build up on those settlements. So there's there's a worry about what will be with those settlements. Another point of another point of disagreement is that Netanyahu says we need to take what we can get, and the Judean Samaria Council says we cannot agree in principle to a Palestinian state. And the third thing is even if we're gonna even if we're gonna agree in principle to a Palestinian state. Why are we only um, applying sovereignty to 30 percent? Under the Oslo Accords, 60 percent were under Israeli control. So those, those are the three points of, uh, of disagreement. All right. Now, Jordanian King Abdullah II, we mentioned this earlier, he's now blocking calls over, over the annexation plans with Netanyahu, and he's also avoiding uh, the requested meetings with Benny Gantz in, in terms of security uh, coordinations. What do you make of that? 
Well, when I, when I worked with uh, uh, Benny alone of blessed memory about uh, 12 years ago, he always said that in private conversations, the last thing that, that, that the Jordanian government wants is a Palestinian state because they know it would spill over into Jordan and try to overthrow the Hashemite kingdom. So most of, so he would always say that most of what the Jordanian government does against Israel in, in, in Judea and Samaria is more of a media stunt and not really what they're saying behind closed doors. So you're not, so you're not terribly worried necessarily about about the rhetoric that's in public. Well, no, I think I think Jordan needs Israel much more than Israel needs Jordan. I see. All right, now I want to move on a little bit more to internal politics right now because co-prime minister and defense minister Benny Gantz visited the justice ministry recently, and and that's causing issues between his blue and white party and the Likud. The Likud is retaliating, so to speak, by threatening to to cancel support for the Norwegian law, which Blue and White needs to increase its membership in the Knesset. Is this a sign of, of you know, the deterioration or the beginning of the end of this unity? Well, well, it could be. I think, uh, I think since the government has been formed, um, we've always seen uh, different polls that show that would there be another round of elections, the Likud would get 40 seats or something close to that, and there would be a, even a right-wing coalition without the Blue and White Party, and the Blue and White Party would go down to something like 12 seats. So we've been hearing, um, we don't know if these polls are coming from the Netanyahu government, but we've been hearing since the government has been established that what would happen if we went to another round of uh, of elections. However, there also have been um, have been uh, you know articles and people talking about that the blue and white ministers have been talking against Netanyahu um, in public interviews and saying we don't believe we don't believe anything he says anyway. And he has also been disappointed with the way the government's been functioning now. So we're at the beginning, but uh, who knows if the you know if the Israeli populace has the appetite for another round of elections. All right, well, I think for most Israelis, they kind of are very exhausted by the elections as well. Gideon Israel, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. All right, in other news, not every Israeli settlement is slated to be absorbed in the upcoming plans to extend sovereignty over parts of Judea and Samaria, or the West Bank. Israeli forces began demolishing illegally built buildings in the Givat HaBaladim and Maoz Esther outposts Monday morning. Both outposts are located in the Israeli-controlled Area C of the West Bank, and at least 10 were arrested in the course of the demolitions, which included five family homes, two synagogues, and eight other structures. Apparently, this is at least the 15th time that buildings in Maoz Esther have been demolished. Moving now from the West Bank to Gaza, Israel is agreeing to transfer the latest $50 million of Qatari aid slated for the Gaza Strip. It's equal to two monthly installments badly needed by the Hamas terror group run enclave, where over two million Palestinians live. And in exchange for the transfer, Hamas has promised to stop sending explosives and incendiary balloons over the border into Israel. Palestinians in the Strip have resumed the use of this crude but devastating practice, reportedly in response to Israeli annexation plans for the West Bank. Thankfully, though, the IDF reports that none of the recent launches actually crossed the border. Now, for more local news, everyone is looking for a way to live greener, but in an increasingly urban landscape, it's getting harder and harder to do. Well, so if you're looking for eco-friendly tips and tricks, look no further. Dr. Alon Eliran, partner and teacher at City Tree, is here to help us out. Doctor, thank you so much for being with us. Now, what is City Tree exactly? So, uh, City Tree uh, has existed for 14 years already, and uh, our main goal at City Tree is to uh, spread knowledge uh, from our lives here at the center of Tel Aviv uh, about any simple little thing uh, we can do, um, again, in our daily lives to live more ecologically, more uh, uh, healthily. Um, and uh, what we can do at our uh, apartment um, Basically, anyone can do um, anywhere, uh, so, even in the in the huh. center of town. And and, of, uh, and and what are and what are some of those ways? Because you know, I, I myself, I'm living in Tel Aviv. How can I reduce and, and you know reduce my waste and and recycle better? Because you know there are a lot of ways that I'd like to, for example, composting, but it, it's very difficult in a small space. So uh, basically, uh, any little detail, any any product we use, uh, 
any of these is uh, a basis for asking questions uh, about where do these things come from, uh, who makes them, uh, and um, how to uh, replace those uh, things which come in uh, packages and uh, are full of unknown materials which might be uh, uh, poisonous uh, and unhealthy. Wow. So this is the basic uh, principle. Specifically, composting is really a very uh, important uh, aspect. Sure. Uh, and uh, we can definitely do it even in uh, small places in uh, local in urban apartments. Uh, well, because we teach three so, different methods, and uh, so so that's what I was going to ask. Actually, them, does City City Tree do you offer you know classes, and you know how do you show people what 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 does City Tree do you know physically? So uh, yes, uh, uh, we definitely uh, have workshops and uh, courses, both online and uh, uh, events uh, happening. Uh, right here at our apartment and uh, in the nearby gardens. So uh, um, other, other than that, we have a website, we have a Facebook page, we have uh, also uh, a YouTube channel and, uh, the, and we have a newsletter, a weekly newsletter full of uh, uh, tips and uh, ideas and invitations to the workshops. Um, and um, uh, well, this is, um, by the way, the, the weekly uh, uh, workshop for English speakers is every Thursday at 7 p.m. All right, so, so, so I'm going to tell all of our viewers now, check out City Tree's YouTube and, and sign up for the newsletter. Learn ways to reduce your, your waste, uh, even in an urban environment. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure. On a more serious note now, the ongoing Black Lives Matter protests sparked by the killing of George Floyd by police have once again brought issues of racism into focus all around the world. And Israel, with a growing population of Ethiopian Jews and African asylum seekers, the issue draws sharp parallels. But addressing prejudice starts in the home, and it requires a deep look within ourselves. So, Joining us to help shine a light is Israeli psychologist Dr. Camila Folkashlavan. Camila, you've actually studied this subject in depth. You know, what are the psychological mechanisms behind racism? So our mind tries to put everything neatly in boxes because it makes it easier to make decision and, uh, decisions and to navigate the world. Uh, how, we pull, how we use those boxes and what are the constructs that we separate or create um, have a lot of, like, the, it's influenced by, by our society and by our culture where we grew up. Mm. All right, so, so, you know, how do we use maybe these stereotypes as a defense mechanism? Because that's what it sounds like you're saying. Right. So if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, knowing the difference between your group and someone else's group might have meant literally not being eaten, yes? Um, and uh, But now, of course, that's not the case, and we need to re-examine those automatic kind of defense mechanisms. I see. So, so what are the psychological and physiological effects of prejudices, prejudice and racism on those victimized by it, you know, other than the obvious, like, police violence? Mm-hmm. So, so it's a really, really important question, and uh, the pe people that grow up in an environment that's very, basically, they, they're affected uh, with the prejudice, yes? So they are vigilant. We can call it paranoia, but it's a healthy kind of paranoia because they actually are uh, being prosecuted, yes? Right. Uh, uh, there is stress, there is anxiety, there is depression, there is difficulty sleeping, there is difficulty in concentration, yeah. uh, there is difficulty in, in kind of moving forward and feeling like, okay, I can succeed and be better or like strive for the stars. There is a big problem with cardiovascular problems, of course, because again, of the stress, cholesterol. So, so these, these are just to name a few, yes? This is a very, very serious problem. All right, now, now I think the real heart of, the, of this conversation here is, you know, how can we break our own prejudicial patterns? Because, you know, you and I, I'm sure, are not immune to this. Yes, so that's the, that's the whole point. The point is that none of us are immune to this because, again, our mind automatically tries to put everything into neat boxes. And so when you, we realize that, this is not as an excuse. This is an, as in to realize that we, none of us, 
are literally immune and we all, each one of us, carry the responsibility to re-examine ourselves, to re-examine our views, and if necessary, reach out and re-examine it with somebody else, because even unfortunately, those that are people of color and, 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 and are facing this prejudice, sometimes also hold these views, which is really sad. And so there's a bunch of research on this in medical community, also with children and choosing toys, like this is a really, really big problem and it needs to be looked on from, from the small meaning each one of us individually to the big mean, meaning on a social and educational level. Wow. All right. Kamina, thank you so much for, for joining me on this important topic. Thank you. thank you. Let's change gears back now to the coronavirus because all of our lives have been changed in ways that we never saw coming. But thanks to social media, we can look back at some of the viral moments of this pandemic. Nittany Manson has the story. With the national lockdown over and fears of a second wave, the coronavirus isn't the only thing going viral. A number of Israelis exploded across the web over the peak of the pandemic and will forever serve as the famous online faces of those isolation days. So let's take a moment to reflect. Starting with this incredible performance of Coldplay's Viva La Vida, Israeli saxophonist Yarden Kleiman giving Tel Avivians in quarantine a rooftop performance they'll never forget, especially with the backing of Roy Brandeis on trumpet and Matan Maman on trombone. <laughs> Next, this heartbreaking plea to the Israeli government to allow him to go back to work. Falafel vendor Yuval Karmi's cries have been viewed over 111,000 times, his message still resonating with Israelis and anyone put out of work by the crisis. <laughs> Your kids are always watching, and this one certainly is a fast learner. This adorable little Israeli's reminder has nearly half a million views, and it's a good thing too, because without her clarifications, her parents would surely be in the dark. The little Oria's parents aren't the only ones with questions. Israeli comedian Yonatan Gruber shared his frustratingly familiar phone call, in which he tries to teach his mother how to use Zoom, the video conferencing app that's also now synonymous with the lockdown. And finally, with almost 3 million views, this Israeli parent's rant against the advent of distance learning. מהבוקר, אנחנו רק ביום השני, מיליוני הודעות בוואטסאפ, יש לי ארבעה ילדים שיהיו בריאים, תדמיינו כמה וואטסאפים, כמה מורות לכל ילד, כמה מקצועות לכל ילד, יש לי רק שני מחשבים בבית, הם רבים מהבוקר על המחשבים, אחד המורים של הבת שלי חי בסרט שהיא בשמונה בבוקר תשב לראות אותו על המסך, היא בשמונה בבוקר רק הופכת צד במיטה, מה נראה לכם? Shiri Kenensberg Levy's message going global, resonating with parents everywhere as they struggle to balance work and the task of homeschooling. So, while scientists are showing the coronavirus affects the heart, it seems it extends as a metaphor as well, with the global relatability connecting humans in our pain and in our humor. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be clear and cool with an average low of 64 Fahrenheit or 17 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow you can expect another sunny and gorgeous day, but with a rise in temperatures to a warm 87 degrees Fahrenheit or 31 degrees Celsius. And now before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. Whoever said that cats were nimble on their feet, that was, that was awesome. <laughs> uh, all right, that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.81 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Aaron Porras, and thank you so much for watching.